the people of the state. Chisholm versus Georgia and popular sovereignty by Randy E. Barnett. Chisholm versus Georgia was the first great constitutional case decided by the Supreme Court. In Chisholm, the court addressed a fundamental question, who is sovereign, the people or the state? It adopted an individual concept of popular sovereignty rather than the modern view that limits popular sovereignty to collective or democratic self-government. It denied that the state of Georgia was a sovereign entitled, like the King of England, to assert immunity from a lawsuit brought by a private citizen. Despite all this, Chisholm is not among the canon of cases that all law students are taught. Why not? In this essay, I offer several reasons. Constitutional law is taught by doctrine rather than chronologically. Law professors have reason to privilege the martial court and the court's individualist view of popular sovereignty is thought to have been repudiated by the adoption of the 11th Amendment. I explain why the 11th Amendment did not repudiate the view of sovereignty expressed in Chisholm by comparing the wording of the 11th with that of the 9th Amendment. I conclude by suggesting another reason why Chisholm is not in the canon. Law professors follow the lead of the Supreme Court and, like the 9th Amendment, the Supreme Court has deemed its first great decision too radical in its implications. Introduction Constitutional law professors know two things that their students often do not. John Marshall was not the first Chief Justice of the United States, and Marbury v. Madison was not the first great constitutional case decided by the Supreme Court. That honor goes to Chisholm v. Georgia, decided some ten years earlier when John Jay was Chief Justice. Students may be unaware of these facts because most basic courses in constitutional law begin with Marbury, which along with Chief Justice Marshall's opinions in McCullough v. Maryland and Gibbons v. Ogden, are the earliest cases that are emphasized. The opinions in Chisholm are never read. At most, the case is mentioned in passing to explain the origin of the 11th Amendment, which reversed its holding. In Chisholm, the Supreme Court, by a vote of 4-1, to one, rejected Georgia's assertion of sovereign immunity as a defense against a suit in federal court for breach of contract brought against it by a citizen of another state. The fundamental nature of this issue presented by the case was aptly characterized by Justice Wilson. This is a case of uncommon magnitude. One of the parties to it is a state, certainly respectable, claiming to be sovereign. The question to be determined is whether this state, so respectable and whose claims soar so high, is amenable to the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court of the United States. This question, important in itself, will depend on others, more important still and may, perhaps, be ultimately resolved into one no less radical than this. Do the people of the United States form a nation? In Chisholm, the justices of the Supreme Court rejected Georgia's claim to be sovereign. They concluded instead that, to the extent the term sovereignty is even appropriately applied to the newly adopted Constitution, sovereignty rests with the people rather than with state governments. This decision is inconsistent with both the modern concept of popular sovereignty that views democratically elected legislatures as exercising the sovereign will of the people and the modern claim that states are entitled to the same immunity as was enjoyed by the King of England. The justices in Chisholm affirmed that, in America, the states are not kings and the legislatures are not the supreme successors to the crown. Section 1. Why We Should Teach Chisholm the judicial opinions in Chisholm are interesting for several reasons. First, the opinions exemplify the early reliance by the courts primarily on first principles, or what Justice Wilson referred to as general principles of right, and only secondarily on the text of the Constitution. Chisholm is typical in this regard. This is not to claim that courts ever continence using first principles to ignore or contradict a pertinent text. Rather, Chisholm well illustrates how first principles were used to interpret the meaning of the text, such as Article 3, Section 2, which specifies that the judicial power of the United States shall extend to controversies between a state and citizens of another state. In Chisholm, Georgia contended that this text needed to be qualified by the extratextual doctrine of sovereign immunity. 
The court did not reject George's claim due to his reliance on first principles. Instead, it rejected the first principles Georgia asserted in favor of others. Justice Wilson began his analysis of Georgia's claim of sovereign immunity by contesting the appropriateness of the very term sovereignty with regard to the new Constitution. To the Constitution of the United States, the term sovereign is totally unknown. There is but one place where it could have been used with propriety, but even in that place, it would not, perhaps, have comported with the delicacy of those who ordained and established that Constitution. They might have announced themselves sovereign people of the United States, but serenely conscious of the fact, they avoided the ostentatious declaration. Wilson then identified possible alternative meanings of the term sovereign. First, the term sovereign has for its correlative subject. In this sense, the term can receive no application, for it has no object in the Constitution of the United States. Under the Constitution, there are citizens, but no subjects. Indeed, Wilson noted that the term subject occurs once in the instrument. But to mark the contrast strongly, the epithet foreign is prefixed. Wilson rejected the concept of subject as inapplicable to states because he knew the government of that state to be Republican. And my short definition of such a government is, one constructed on this principle, that the supreme power resides in the body of the people. Furthermore, Wilson argued that, the citizens of Georgia, when they acted upon the large scale of the Union as a part of the people of the United States, did not surrender the supreme or sovereign power to that state, but, as to the purposes of the Union, retained it to themselves. And as to the purposes of the Union, therefore, Georgia is not a sovereign state. In other words, according to Justice Wilson, to the extent one wishes to use the word sovereignty at all, Sovereignty lies in the people themselves, not in any government formed by the people. Wilson then considered another sense of sovereignty that related to the feudal power of English kings. Into England, this system was introduced by the conqueror, and to this area we may, probably, refer the English maxim that the king or sovereign is the fountain of justice. With regard to him, there was no superior power, and, consequently, on feudal principles, no right of jurisdiction. Wilson characterized this as only a branch of a much more extensive principle on which a plan of systematic despotism has been lately formed in England and prosecuted with unwearied assiduity and care. Wilson rejected this feudal notion of sovereignty as inconsistent with another principle very different in its nature and operations and forms the basis of sound and genuine jurisprudence. This is the principle that laws derived from the pure source of equality and justice must be founded on the consent of those whose obedience they require. The sovereign, when traced to his source, must be found in the man. In other words, obedience must rest on the consent of the only sovereign from which justice and equality rests, the individual person who is asked to obey the law. Wilson believed that the only reason a free man is bound by human laws is that he binds himself. Upon the same principles upon which he becomes bound by the laws, he becomes amendable to the courts of justice which are formed and authorized by those laws. The state governments are simply the product of these very same people, themselves bound by laws, who have banded together to form a government. As such, states are as bound by the laws as are the ultimate sovereign individuals that establish them. If one free man, an original sovereign, may do all this, why may not an aggregate of free men, a collection of original sovereigns, do this likewise? If the dignity of each singly is undiminished, the dignity of all jointly must be unimpaired. From this analysis, Wilson reached the following conclusion about Georgia's claim of sovereign immunity against a suit for breach of contract. A state, like a merchant, makes a contract. A dishonest state, like a dishonest merchant, willfully refuses to discharge it. The latter is amendable to a court of justice. Upon general principles of right shall the former, when summoned to answer the fair demands of its creditor, be permitted, Proteus-like, to assume a new appearance and to insult him in justice by declaring I am a sovereign state? Surely not. That Justice Wilson was the author of this opinion is significant. James Wilson was as crucial a member of the Constitutional Convention as any other, including James Madison. His defense of the Constitution in the Pennsylvania Ratification Convention was lengthy and influential, and that state's early ratification set the stage for the Constitution's eventual adoption in other key states. 
Wilson was also among the most theoretically sophisticated of the founders, as his lectures on laws given as a professor from 1790 to 1792 at the College of Pennsylvania demonstrate. Indeed, one reason why his opinion in Chisholm may be overlooked is that it may seem too long and theoretical to be a good judicial opinion. Justice Wilson was not alone in locating sovereignty in the individual person. Chief Justice Jay, in his opinion, referred tellingly to the joint and equal sovereigns of this country. Jay affirmed the great and glorious principle that the people are the sovereign of this country, and consequently that fellow citizens and joint sovereigns cannot be degraded by appearing with each other in their own courts to have their controversies determined. Denying individuals a right to sue a state while allowing them to sue municipalities would not correspond with the equal rights we claim, with the equality we profess to admire and maintain, and with the popular sovereignty in which every citizen partakes. Neither Wilson nor Jay's individualist view of sovereignty fits comfortably into the notion of popular sovereignty as purely collective concept. Even Justice Iredale, the sole dissenter in Chisholm, did not rest his dissent on a rejection of the joint and individual sovereignty of the people. Instead, he devoted the bulk of his opinion to the question of whether the Supreme Court has jurisdiction to hear a breach of contract case in the absence of express authorization either by the Constitution itself or by Congress. Because he concluded that such authorization was both required and lacking, Iredale contended that the suit should have been dismissed. Had this reasoning prevailed, there would have been no need to reach the issue of sovereignty, which Justice Iredale addressed only in passing. Justice Wilson and Chief Justice Jay's individualist concept of sovereignty was later passionately expanded upon by John Taylor in response to the Supreme Court's opinion in McCullough. I do not know how it has happened that this word has crept into our political dialect, unless it be that mankind prefer mystery to knowledge, and that governments love obscurity better than specification. The unknown powers of sovereignty and supremacy may be relished because they tickle the mind with hopes and fears, just as we indulge the taste with cayenne pepper, though it disorders the health and finally destroys the body. Governments delight in a power to administer the palatable drugs of exclusive privileges and pecuniary gifts, and selfishness is willing enough to receive them. And this mutual pleasure may possibly have suggested the ingenious stratagem for neutralizing constitutional restrictions by a single word. In his lengthy treatment on the subject, Taylor notes, Sovereignty implies superiority and subordination. It was therefore inapplicable to a case of equality, and more so to the subordinate power in reference to its creator. The word being rejected by our constitutions cannot be correctly adopted for their construction. It would produce several very obvious contradictions in our political principles. It would transfer sovereignty from the people, confining it to mean the right of self-government only, to their own servants. It would invest governments and departments invested with limited powers only with unspecified powers. It would create many sovereignties, each having a right to determine the extent of its sovereignty by its own will. Our constitutions, therefore, wisely rejected this indefinite word as a traitor of civil rights and endeavored to kill it dead by specifications and restrictions of power that it might never be used again in political disquisitions. While Justice Iredale would have afforded to states the sovereignty of kings, Taylor identified whence kings appropriated the term. He observed that the term sovereignty was sacrilegiously stolen from the attributes of God and impiously assumed by kings. He then condemned the importation of the concept into a republican system. Though kings committed the theft, aristocracies and republics have claimed the spoil. Taylor denied that the U.S. Constitution included the concept. By our constitutions, we rejected the errors upon which our forefathers had been wrecked and withheld from our governments the keys of temporal and eternal rights by usurping which their patriots had been converted into tyrants and invested them only with the powers to restrain internal wrongs and to resist foreign hostility without designing to establish a sovereign power of robbing one citizen to enrich another. By omitting Chisholm from the canon, students learn none of this. They are left unexposed to the radical yet fundamental idea that if anyone is sovereign, it is we the people as individuals, in contrast with the modern view that locates popular sovereignty in Congress or state legislatures, which supposedly represents the will of the people. Another reason for teaching schism is that it represents the road not taken with respect to constitutional amendments. Congress and the states choose to follow the advice of Justice Blair, 
if the Constitution is found inconvenient in practice in this or any other particular, he wrote in his opinion, it is well that a regular mode is pointed out for amendment. Precisely because its holdings was reversed two years later by the ratification of the 11th Amendment, Chisholm represents an opportunity to consider how the practice of constitutional interpretation by courts might have been different in the tradition of correcting Supreme Court decisions by express amendment had taken hold. The 11th Amendment reads as follows. The judicial power of the United States should not be construed to extend to any suit in law or equity, commenced or prosecuted against one of the United States by citizens of another state or by citizens or subjects of any foreign state. As I discussed below, there are two distinctly different ways by which this language reversed the court's decision in Chisholm. The first is the assumption of modern so-called 11th Amendment cases. The enactment of the 11th Amendment could imply that the Supreme Court had incorrectly interpreted the Constitution and the amendment therefore restores its original meaning. But second, the enactment of the 11th Amendment could imply instead that the court was correct in its interpretation of Article 3, but the states were so unhappy with this implication of the original meaning of the Constitution that they sought successfully to change the original meaning by using Article 5. Somewhere in between these two implications lies the possibility that the court's decision was within the range of permissible interpretations of the original text, as was the 11th Amendment, in which case, once again, the court was not mistaken about the original meaning of the Constitution. In any case, if written amendments were socially accepted as a more normal reaction to an objectionable Supreme Court decision, the need perceived by some for the Supreme Court to engage in creative interpretation might be obviated. The rapid adoption of the 11th Amendment suggests that Article 5 constitutional amendments can be practical, provided the legal and political culture views amendments as a natural response either to a Supreme Court misinterpretation of the Constitution or to a correct interpretation of our imperfect Constitution with which there is a widespread dissatisfaction. Today, like in a culture of written amendment, Correct but objectionable interpretations of the Constitution have to be treated as misinterpretations to justify judicial intervention. Section 2. Why We Neglect Chisholm Before addressing what the 11th Amendment should be understood to imply about the correctness of the decision in Chisholm, it is worth pausing for a moment to ask why Chisholm and the adoption of the 11th Amendment are usually omitted from the canon. The set of cases almost always covered in the basic course of constitutional law. There are at least three plausible reasons. First, constitutional law is ordinarily taught doctrine by doctrine rather than chronologically. If one organizes the course by modern doctrines, there is no obvious or natural place in which to include Chisholm because the nature of sovereignty is not among the doctrines normally taught in either the structures or the rights portions of constitutional law. True, Chisholm and the 11th Amendment could be taught in a traditional structures course, and some professors surely do, because, however, professors do not traditionally cover the concept of sovereignty in constitutional law and consider the doctrine of sovereign immunity an additional doctrinal topic, and a complex one at that. Chisholm itself is typically omitted. By the same token, when teaching constitutional law doctrine by doctrine, there is no natural place in which to cover the case of Prigg versus Pennsylvania, which concerns the meaning of the Fugitive Slave Clause. Even the pivotal case of Dred Scott versus Sanford does not fit neatly into the introductory courses devoted mainly to structural issues. Were constitutional law taught chronologically rather than doctrine by doctrine, it would be an open invitation to begin the course by studying the first great constitutional controversy, the debate in Congress and within the Washington administration over the first bank of the United States, and follow that with the question that occupied the Supreme Court in Chisholm, its first major decision the nature of sovereignty in the United States. And it would be equally natural to move from there to coverage of the Marshall Court's famous decisions, Marbury v. Madison, McCullough v. Maryland, and Gibbons v. Ogden, followed by the infamous slavery decision of the Taney Court. An opening sequence such as this would convey to students an entirely different impression of the subject of constitutional law that does the more typical approach that is organized by doctrine and often begins with Marbury. It would also make far more meaningful to students both Chief Justice Marshall's views on the nature of sovereignty that he articulates in McCullough, which otherwise seems superfluous, and Chief Justice Taney's views of sovereignty expressed in Dred Scott. 
In other words, Chisholm is just the first of several landmark Supreme Court treatments of the nature of sovereignty, but dropping it from the canon distorts the teaching of this subject as the Marshall Court opinions are studied out of context. The second reason we lead with Marbury rather than with Chisholm is that, until relatively recently, constitutional law professors in the post-Warren Court era viewed judicial review as an engine of social justice. Although enthusiasm for judicial review has waned in recent years, as witnessed by the recent interest in judicial minimalism, taking the Constitution away from the courts, and popular constitutionalism, this current intellectual trend has yet to affect the organization of the basic course in constitutional law. So judicial review still kicks off most case books that were devised years before interest developed in the Constitution outside the courts. A third reason for omitting Chisholm is that, according to modern Supreme Court decisions dating back to the 1890 case of Hines v. Louisiana, the 11th Amendment repudiated Chisholm's view of sovereignty and, therefore, the decision itself is a dead letter. Even when professors include the 11th Amendment in the basic constitutional law course, they cover it well after Marbury and usually relegate Chisholm to a passing footnote in the coverage of the modern 11th Amendment cases. This last reason for ignoring Chisholm, that the adoption of the 11th Amendment repudiated it, is the subject of the balance of this essay. I contest the modern court's claim that the 11th Amendment repudiated the view of sovereignty the court had previously adopted in Chisholm. Although I'm hardly the first person to question this claim, I hope to add to the current discussion by offering a comparison of the wording of the 9th and 11th Amendment that undercuts the claim that the 11th Amendment repudiated the individualist concept of sovereignty the court relied upon in Chisholm. Consequently, I joined a diverse group of other scholars who have concluded that the modern Supreme Court's so-called 11th Amendment line of cases is based on a faulty reading of the 11th Amendment dating back to Hans and is fundamentally misconceived. Section 3. Why the 11th Amendment did not repudiate Chisholm's approach to popular sovereignty. To assess the relationship between the 11th Amendment and Chisholm, it is useful to identify clearly the two alternative readings of the amendment. First, the amendment could be read narrowly and simply reversing the holding of Chisholm that states may be sued by citizens of other states in federal court. Of course, by also immunizing states from suits by subjects of foreign nations, the amendment does more than this which may be significant, as we shall see. According to this interpretation, the 11th Amendment leaves entirely intact the underlying individualist concept of popular sovereignty upon which the court rested its holding. The amendment merely negates one constitutional implication of this more general concept of popular sovereignty. A second reading of the amendment is the one adopted by the Supreme Court in Hans versus Louisiana that continues to be accepted by the court today. In Seminole Tribe of Florida versus Florida, Chief Justice Rehnquist provided a concise summary of this position. Although the text of the amendment would appear to restrict only the Article III diversity jurisdiction of the federal courts, we have understood the 11th Amendment to stand not so much for what it says, but for the presupposition which it confirms. That presupposition, first observed over a century ago in Hans versus Louisiana, has two parts. First, that each state is a sovereign entity in our federal system, and second, that it's inherent in the nature of sovereignty not to be amendable to the suit of an individual without its consent. Chief Justice Rehnquist excoriates the dissent for relying upon the now discredited decision in Chisholm versus Georgia, and he affirms the court's conclusion in Hans that the views of state sovereignty articulated by Justice Iredale in his dissent were clearly right as the people of the United States in their sovereign capacity subsequently decided when it enacted the 11th Amendment. The modern 11th Amendment doctrine, therefore, rests not on the literal text of the amendment, but rather on what the court claims to be its underlying principle. What Chief Justice Rehnquist referred to as the amendment's presupposition, and what Justice Kennedy referred to in Alden v. Maine as fundamental postulates implicit in the constitutional design. Chief Justice Rehnquist is quite forthright about his departure from the text in favor of a more reasonable construction. The dissent's lengthy analysis on the text of the 11th Amendment is directed at a straw man. We long have recognized that blind reliance upon the text of the 11th Amendment is to strain the Constitution and the law to a construction never imagined or dreamed of. The text dealt in terms only with the problem presented by the decision in Chisholm. As I've already noted, however, this last sentence is not quite true. 
The text of the 11th Amendment goes beyond the narrow problem of a state being sued by a citizen of another state in federal court and extends to suits by citizens or subjects of any foreign state. Professor John Manning finds this to be significant. Indeed, so discriminating is the text that it parses a subcategory from amidst the final head of jurisdiction, controversies between a state and foreign states, citizens, or subjects. Leave it untouched, suits between a state and foreign states, while restricting suits against states by foreign citizens or subjects. As a first cut, this fact suggests at least that the amendment's framers carefully picked and chose among Article 3, Section 2, Clause 1's categories in determining what jurisdiction immunity to prescribe. From this, Manning concludes that the 11th Amendment's careful inclusion and omission of particular heads of Article 3's jurisdiction creates at least a prima facie case that the amendment process entailed judgments about the precise context in which it was desirable, or perhaps politically feasible, to provide for state sovereign immunity. It is striking that the court, beginning with Hans and continuing through today, has employed a version of originalism that, in recent years, has been repudiated by most originalists. This version is based on the original intentions of either the framers or ratifiers rather than upon the original public meaning of the text they adopted. By using the principles, presuppositions, or postulates allegedly held by the drafters to override the public meaning of the text itself, the court in Hans employed the same version of original intent originalism that Chief Justice Taney used in Dred Scott when interpreting the meaning of the people in the preamble and in the Declaration of Independence. Justice Bradley's opinion in Hans exemplifies a typical feature of original intent originalism, its reliance on the counterfactual hypothetical intentions of the framers. Can we suppose that when the 11th Amendment was adopted, it was understood to be left open for citizens of a state to sue their own state in federal courts, whilst the idea of suits by citizens of other states or of foreign states was indignantly repelled? Suppose that Congress, when proposing the 11th Amendment, had appended to it a provisio that nothing therein contained should prevent a state from being sued by its own citizens in cases arising under the Constitution or laws of the United States. Can we imagine that it would have been adopted by the states? The supposition that it would is almost an absurdity on its face. How similar this sounds to Chief Justice Taney's method in Dred Scott. Given the certitude with which a majority of justices now believe that the court's interpretation of the text in Chisholm was erroneous and that the 11th Amendment merely reestablished the status quo ante, it is useful to remember that Chief Justice John Marshall apparently did not agree. In Fletcher v. Peck, he continued to affirm that the court's reading of the Constitution in Chisholm was correct until the text was altered by the 11th Amendment. In a much neglected passage, he described the principles that states were amenable to suits in federal courts as originally engrafted in that instrument, though no longer a part of it. The Constitution, as passed, gave the courts of the United States jurisdiction in suits brought against individual states. A state, then, which violated its own contract was suable in the courts of the United States for that violation. This feature is no longer found in the Constitution, but it aids in the construction of those clauses with which it was originally associated. In other words, in Fletcher, Marshall explicitly rejected the proposition that Chisholm was incorrectly decided. The proposition first asserted in Hines some 100 years after the adoption of the 11th Amendment. And, like the court in Chisholm, Marshall rejected an argument in favor of presuming an intention to accept a case not accepted by the words of the Constitution. In his article, Manny defends the narrow interpretation of the 11th Amendment by making an important methodological claim about originalist textualism. Specific constitutional text should be interpreted specifically according to its terms and not expanded, contracted, or contradicted by the purposes, original intentions, or underlying principles for which the text was adopted. Given the heightened consensus requirements imposed by Article 5, he writes, when an amendment speaks with exceptional specificity, interpreters must be sensitive to the possibility that the drafters were willing to go, or realistically could go, only so far and no further with their policy. When such compromise is evident, respect for the minority veto indicates that those implementing the amendment should hew closely to the lines actually drawn, lest they disturb some unrecorded concession insisted upon by the minority or offered preemptively by the majority as part of the price of assent. In short, Manning continues, 
when the amendment process addresses a specific question and resolves it in a precise way, greater cause exists for interpreters to worry about invoking general sources of constitutional authority to submerge the carefully drawn lines of a more specific compromise. Manny suggests that one justification for the conclusion that the original public meaning of the 11th Amendment was limited to its precise terms is based on the legal background against which the amendment was adopted. The most salient background assumption for the 11th Amendment was the court's decision in Chisholm in which four or five justices denied the existence, as a general matter, of state sovereign immunity, with Justices Wilson and Jay specifically asserting that state sovereign immunity was flatly incompatible with the premises of our Republican form of government. According to the Chisholm Court, states may be sued by individuals in federal court to enforce their private contractual rights. And the state's assertion that the text of Article 3 should be qualified by an unenumerated immunity from suit based on their sovereignty is inconsistent with the fundamental principles of republicanism on which the Constitution rests. The court's decision in Chisholm, therefore, put before Congress, the states, and the people of the nation a proposition concerning the nature of sovereignty that, while it may have been implicit in the text of Article 3, might have been widely apparent. With this issue now unequivocally presented by the decision in Chisholm, did Congress respond with an amendment squarely rejecting the court's view of popular sovereignty as resting in the people as individuals rather than in the states? It did not. Instead, it responded with a very narrow, precisely worded withdrawal of judicial power, subject matter jurisdiction, and two specific circumstances. Would the 11th Amendment have been ratified so swiftly or at all if it had been more broadly worded? Manning contends that we can never know the answer to this question. The wording of the amendment could well have been a product of compromise within the drafting process or have been drafted in anticipation of potential but not yet realized opposition to a broader claim of state sovereignty. To interpret the amendment more broadly than the language that was actually proposed and ratified is to run a serious risk of overriding the desires of either a majority or a potential ratification blocking minority who would never have consented to a broader claim of state power. Furthermore, it may well have been the case that nationalists, federalists, and Congress gave the states the bare minimum needed to mollify them. Again, because it is impossible to know for certain, the court should adhere to the public meaning of the text actually adopted rather than overriding specific texts by appealing to an allegedly broad underlying purpose or principle. Manning's summary of this argument here is worth quoting at length. Neither Article Three nor any other provision of the original Constitution dealt directly with the problem of sovereign immunity, and American society had had no previous occasion to confront the question squarely, one way or the other. When dissatisfaction with Chisholm brought the Article Five process to bear on that previously unanswered question, the text that emerged quite clearly went so far and no farther in embracing state sovereign immunity. Perhaps the resultant line drawing merely reflected an inability to secure the requisite supermajorities for a broader amendment. But if so, that would be fully consistent with the expected play of Article 5, especially in the context of an amendment process designed to protect political minorities. One cannot disregard the selective inclusion and exclusion implicit in such careful specification. If American society for the first time was explicitly confronting the appropriate limitations on potential Article III jurisdiction over suits against states, one should perhaps attach significance not only to what the drafters placed in the amendment, but also to what they deem necessary or even prudent to exclude. To do otherwise would risk upsetting whatever precise compromise may have emerged from the carefully drawn lawmaking process prescribed by Article V. Although I find persuasive Manning's argument against using underlying purposes to expand the specific wording of the 11th Amendment, he fails to consider another possible defense of the court's so-called 11th Amendment jurisprudence. Constitutional texts not only have a literal grammatical meaning in themselves, they also have what Professor Lawrence Salome has called constitutional implicature. These implications can be expressed references in the text to concepts or can be implied affirmances of underlying assumptions that went unmentioned in the text. Shifting the assumptions underlying the text would distort rather than faithfully adhere to the public meaning of the text. An implication of the text is not the same as its purpose. A piece of text can have many purposes and these purposes are largely extratextual.
A particular provision of a text is very likely to be either under or over-inclusive of its underlying purposes, or both. Moreover, while there was a demonstrable consensus concerning the adoption of a particular wording of a text, there may have been no comparable consensus about underlying purposes. In contrast, an implication of the text is a product of its meaning, though it may not be expressed in so many words. While saying one thing, it may imply something compatible with, though beyond, what it says, and the original public meaning of the Constitution might be distorted if this implication is later denied or reversed, while the specific express meaning of the text is preserved. A good example of constitutional implicature can be found in the Ninth Amendment, the only other provision of the Constitution explicitly to provide a rule for how the Constitution should not be construed. The Ninth Amendment says, The enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights should not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. Read literally, the Ninth Amendment rejects just one construction of the text, a construction that is based on the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights. Its injunction applies only when the enumeration of certain rights in the Constitution is offered as a reason for denying others retained by the people. According to this reading, the Ninth Amendment would have no application whatsoever outside the assertion of this specific misconstruction based on the enumeration of rights. Before questioning this claim, it is important to stress that even this limited reading of the Ninth Amendment as solely a rule of construction in this one circumstance would render it extremely important. Such a reading would specifically negate a key claim of the most important footnote in Supreme Court history that says, in relevant part, there may be narrower scope for operation of the presumption of constitutionality when legislation appears on its face to be within a specific prohibition of the Constitution, such as those of the first ten amendments, which are deemed equally specific when held to be embraced within the fourteenth. Footnote four of United States versus Coraline Products is directly asserting that the enumeration in the Constitution of certain express prohibitions is reason to deny or disparage any constitutional claims based on other rights retained by the people. Even were the presumption of constitutionality affirmed in Coraline Products simply a burden-shifting presumption, it would disparage the other rights retained by the people, though perhaps not deny them altogether. But later, in cases such as Williamson versus Lee Optical, the presumption was rendered effectively irrebuttable, resulting in the effectual denial of unenumerated rights until Griswold v. Connecticut. Today, judicial conservatives urge a return, not to the original meaning of the Ninth Amendment, even narrowly construed as above, but to the New Deal Court's philosophy of footnote four when they disparage the protection by the courts of any unenumerated rights. For example, Justice Scalia, in his dissent in Troxel v. Granville, wrote that, the Constitution's refusal to deny or disparage other rights is far removed from affirming any one of them, and even further removed from authorizing judges to identify what they might be and to enforce the judge's list against laws duly enacted by the people. Notice Justice Scalia's rather blithe identification of the legislature with the people themselves, an equation that was widely rejected at the founding and expressly denied by the Supreme Court in Chisholm. I want to claim, however, that the text of the Ninth Amendment does more than expressly reject the construction of the Constitution provided by footnote 4. It also implies the existence of other rights retained by the people. Why? For one thing, it refers explicitly to these other rights. While it does not expressly call for the affirmative protection of these rights, the rule of construction it proposes would make absolutely no sense if there were no such other rights. Why else would an entire amendment have been added to the Constitution barring a construction of enumerated rights that would deny or disparage these other rights? Of course, we have overwhelming historical evidence, independent of the text, that the founders believed that the people possess individual natural rights. But the Ninth Amendment adds a textual affirmation of this underlying assumption of the text that could otherwise be denied. Therefore, notwithstanding the limits of its express injunction, the existence of the Ninth Amendment's reference to other rights retained by the people provides important textual support for the following conclusion. Any construction of the Constitution that results in the denial of these rights would violate the Constitution's original public meaning, not merely a construction based on the enumeration of certain rights. It is my claim that the rule of construction provided by the Ninth Amendment has important implications for the protection of other rights that are not to be denied shed any light on the meaning of the Eleventh Amendment? 
to the Supreme Court's invocation of the presupposition of state sovereignty likewise be justified as an implication of its specific text rather than as a reflection of the underlying purpose of the 11th Amendment as characterized by John Manning? Just as the Ninth Amendment presupposes and textually affirms the existence of unenumerated rights, might the 11th Amendment not presuppose and textually affirm the existence of state sovereignty? This seems to be what Chief Justice Rehnquist was suggesting when he dismissed a blind reliance on the text of the amendment in Seminole Tribe. A blind reliance would be limiting the text to its terms while denying what it implies. With a blind reliance on the text of the Ninth Amendment that limits it solely to a narrow rule of construction, or a blind reliance on the text of the Eleventh Amendment that limits it solely to barring two specific types of plaintiffs suing state governments in federal court. A careful comparison of the Ninth and Eleventh Amendments, however, undermines rather than supports a claim that the text of the Eleventh Amendment implies the rejection of the broad reasoning of Chisholm. First, and most obviously, Unlike the Ninth Amendment's explicit reference to others retained by the people, the Eleventh Amendment contains no explicit reference either to a principle of state sovereignty or to a doctrine of state sovereign immunity. The Ninth Amendment's injunction against drawing a particular conclusion from the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights contains within it an express reference to, and therefore an implied affirmation of, the other rights retained by the people, coupled with the additional implication that these rights not be denied or disparaged. To reach a contrary conclusion about the Ninth Amendment would require the acceptance of the proposition that there are no other rights retained by the people or that those rights that do exist may be denied or disparaged at the will of the legislature, provided only that such a denial is not justified on the ground that some rights were enumerated. But why foreclose this, and only this, justification of denying unenumerated rights by means of a constitutional amendment? Clearly, the denial of unenumerated rights was the general evil to be avoided, and the amendment was included to guard against a particular source of this evil that was aggravated by the addition of the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights. And the source of this evil is the foreseeable assertion of the doctrine of expressio unius. To express or include one thing implies the exclusion of the other. Although the text of the 11th Amendment lacks any comparable textual reference to state sovereignty or state sovereign immunity, would it nevertheless be fair to infer these concepts from what the text does affirm? I think not. To see why, let us imagine a hypothetical amendment dealing with unenumerated rights whose origin would parallel that of the 11th. Recall that for two years after the ratification of the Constitution, there was no Bill of Rights, so there was no express prohibition on takings of private property for public use. Suppose that during this period, the federal government took land for the public use of building and a post office without making just compensation to the property owner. When the owner brings suit for compensation, the government denies the existence of any such right to compensation. Now suppose further that, notwithstanding the absence of an express takings clause, the Supreme Court holds that the property owner is nevertheless entitled to just compensation. The opinions of the justices are clearly based, first and foremost, on an extensive analysis of the pre-existent natural rights retained by the people that no Republican government can properly deny or disparage, including the rights to life, liberty, property, and the pursuit of happiness. One justice in the majority, call him Justice Chase, contends that there are certain vital principles in our free Republican governments which will determine and overrule an apparent and flagrant abuse of legislative power as to authorize manifest injustice by positive law or to take away that security for personal liberty or private property for the protection whereof the government was established. Textually, the court grounds its holding in the necessary and proper clause, reasoning that a law authorizing a taking of private property for public use without just compensation is not a proper law. A lone dissenter, call him Justice Iredale, protests this reliance on unenumerated rights. In his words, it is true that some speculative jurists have held that a legislative act against natural justice must in itself be void, but I cannot think that, under such a government, any court of justice would possess a power to declare it so. Far from being entirely hypothetical, the court eventually used this type of reasoning when it first required states to make just compensation for their taking under the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. 
and Chicago, Burlington and Quincy Railroad Company versus Chicago. It interpreted the 14th Amendment as barring states from taking property for public use without just compensation, not by incorporating or even invoking the express taking clause of the Fifth Amendment, but because the due protection of the rights of property has been regarded as a vital principle of Republican institutions. Consequently, if a legislative enactment assuming arbitrarily to take the property of one individual and give it to another individual would not be due process of laws enjoined by the 14th Amendment, it must be that the requirement of due process of law in that amendment is applicable to the direct appropriation by the state to public use and without compensation of the private property of the citizen. The legislature may prescribe a form of procedure to be observed in the taking of private property for public use, but it is not due process of law if provision be not made for compensation. Now imagine that Congress, in direct response to this hypothetical takings decision of the court, seeks to overrule it by enacting a constitutional amendment. Two versions are proposed. The first reads, The judicial power of the United States shall not be construed to encompass the power to grant just compensation as a remedy for takings of private property for public use. The second reads, this constitution shall not be construed to encompass a judicial power to enforce any right not expressly enumerated herein. Congress then chooses to propose and the states to ratify the first rather than second of these amendments. A century later, it is argued that the enacted text presupposes that no unenumerated rights are ever to be judicially protected. Given this sequence of events, would this be a permissible construction of the amendment actually ratified? Would it be reasonable to claim that the substance of the second proposed version was implied by adopting the text of the first? Or would it instead be more reasonable to conclude, first, that the scope of the amendment actually adopted was limited solely to takings, and second, that by adopting the first version rather than the second, Congress declined to reverse the broader reasoning of the court that put the issue of the right to compensation before the Congress? In other words, unlike the broader version, the narrowly worded amendment left the broad reasoning of the court intact. Why Congress might have chosen the narrow amendment may be unknowable. Perhaps it accepted the court's general reasoning about unenumerated constitutional rights, but rejected its implication for the particular right to be compensation for public takings. Perhaps it disliked the court's general reasoning, but was fearful that the more general amendment would get hung up in the ratification process, and it took what it felt confident it could get. Manning's point is that we cannot know for sure everything that might have led Congress to choose the narrower formulation. Would it change the analysis if only the narrow version of the amendment had been proposed so that the broader wording was not directly rejected in favor of the narrower reading? While perhaps reducing our certainty a tiny bit, I think that such a change in the hypothetical does not affect the ultimate conclusion. For in the hypothetical story that produced the amendment, it was the notorious assertion by the court of a general judicial power to protect unenumerated rights that engendered the controversy. Knowing this, Congress nevertheless addressed just one application of this more general power. The conclusion remains that Congress left this judicially claimed power intact. This is not to claim that the original judicial opinion was necessarily a correct interpretation of the Constitution, but only that the subsequent hypothetical amendment narrowly reversing its holding did not challenge its interpretive correctiveness. The narrowly drafted words of the 11th Amendment were adopted by Congress in the face of the court's open denial of state sovereignty, especially in the opinions of Justice Wilson and Chief Justice Jay. In so doing, Congress turned away from more broadly worded amendments. For example, Massachusetts Congressman Theodore Segwick initially proposed the following amendment that no state shall be liable to be made a party defendant in any of the judicial courts established or which shall be established under the authority of the United States at the suit of any person or persons, whether a citizen or citizens or a foreigner or foreigners or of any body politic or corporate, whether within or without the United States. But even this more sweeping grant of immunity speaks in the jurisdictional terms of Article 3 and concerns the scope of the judicial power rather than confronting directly the Supreme Court's denial of the concept of state sovereignty itself. The terms of the public debate over Chisholm focus primarily on the suitability of states, not on their sovereignty. It is not clear whether Chief Justice Rehnquist believed that the 11th Amendment should be viewed as a repudiation of the principle that the people and not the states are sovereign. 
It is, however, certain that he adduced no evidence that those who proposed and ratified the 11th Amendment did so in order to establish that the prerogatives of state government equal those of the English king. Conclusion, the dangerousness of Chisholm. Let me conclude by emphasizing what I'm not claiming in this essay. Despite the time I've spent discussing the 11th Amendment, this is not an essay about its original meaning. A rich and challenging literature examining this issue already exists. Nor am I proposing that we start our teaching of constitutional law by examining the scope and meaning of the 11th Amendment. That may well be too complex for students just beginning their study of the Constitution to comprehend. Rather, my only claim about the 11th Amendment is to identify a single meaning it did not have. Contrary to what the Supreme Court now maintains, the 11th Amendment was not a repudiation of the individualist conception of popular sovereignty articulated by Justice Wilson and Chief Justice Jay. The narrow and technical language of the 11th Amendment could not reasonably have been understood either as a repudiation of the grand and magisterial idea that we the people are sovereign or as establishing the power of the English monarchy as the model of state government authority. Given all of this, I submit that beginning the study of constitutional law with the deep issues in Chisholm, as well as with the importance of constitutional amendments, is preferable to beginning with Chief Justice Marshall's defense of judicial review in Marbury, as has become the custom. Second, I'm not claiming that Congress was affirming the broader reasoning of the case when it reversed only the narrow holding of Chisholm. John Manning seems to suggest otherwise, and he may well be right, but For the present, I am merely denying that the broader principle of state sovereignty to which Chief Justice Rehnquist referred as a presupposition of the text of the 11th Amendment. So far as constitutional implicature is concerned, the 11th Amendment leads the reasoning of Chisholm as it was. As such, it must be judged on its merits. If it was wrongly decided, the 11th Amendment adds little, if any, support for that conclusion. Nor am I claiming in this essay that the court in Chisholm was correct in its conception of popular sovereignty as belonging to the people as individuals and not to the state or state governments, either as a matter of constitutional theory or of history. Of course, my sympathies on this subject should be obvious, that Chisholm was decided close to the enactment of the Constitution in sharp contrast to the court's decision in Hans 100 years later and that the individualist concept of popular sovereignty was affirmed by the eminences of James Wilson and John Jay is powerful evidence that the people to which the Constitution refers was indeed an individualist concept. At a minimum, it is plainly not anachronistic to attribute to some individualists a sense of sovereignty to that era. The proposition that joint sovereignty resides in the individuals who comprise the people is also textually supported by the wording of the Tenth Amendment, which confirms that all powers not delegated to the general government by the Constitution are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. If at least some of the other rights retained by the people to which the Ninth Amendment refers belongs to individuals, as I believe the evidence shows, it would be exceedingly odd if the people to which the Tenth Amendment refers are not also individuals. And the people is explicitly distinguished from the states. I confess, and I am beginning to suspect, that the purely collective reading of the people by Professor Akhil Lamar and others may well be anachronistic, but to establish this proposition would require more investigation into historical sources than I have yet to attempt. My only claim with respect to the 11th Amendment is that it did not displace the individualist concept of the people affirmed by the court, whether rightly or wrongly, in Chisholm. And unlike the Ninth Amendment, which makes no sense whatsoever without presupposing the existence of the very unenumerated rights to which it refers, the Eleventh Amendment makes perfect sense whether or not you assume the existence of state sovereignty. It can fairly be read as carving out of federal jurisdiction suits brought by two types of parties, an alteration in the jurisdiction afforded by Article Three that required a change in the original Constitution to accomplish. At a minimum, the conclusion that Chisholm's individualist concept of sovereignty was not repudiated by the 11th Amendment justifies including this concept among the contenders for how popular sovereignty was conceived at the time of the founding. But putting aside the 11th Amendment, the really interesting challenge posed by Chisholm is its individualist theory of popular sovereignty. What does it mean to say that the people are joint sovereigns? This brings me to a final reason why Chisholm is not among the canon of constitutional law cases of which all learned lawyers must be aware. 
Chisholm may be ignored for the very same reason that the Ninth Amendment is ignored. It is simply too radical. Indeed, the individualist popular sovereignty affirmed in Chisholm is the opposite side of the very same coin as the other individual rights retained by the people as affirmed by the Ninth Amendment. It may well be that the concept of sovereignty affirmed in Chisholm, the original meaning of the Ninth Amendment, and the original meaning of the Privileges or Immunities Clause of the Fourteenth Amendment, all ignored by the court because the implications of taking them seriously are so momentous. And law professors tend to internalize the Supreme Court's boundaries on respectable legal arguments, and vice versa. If nothing else, Chisholm teaches that the concept of sovereignty as residing in the body of the people as individuals was alive at the time of the founding and well enough to be adopted by two justices of the Supreme Court who were also influential founders. Likewise, Chisholm shows that the bold assertion that states inherited the power of kings subject only to express constitutional constraints was rejected by four or five justices when the issue first arose. By admitting Chisholm versus Georgia, the first great constitutional case from the canon of constitutional law, we have turned our gaze away from perhaps the most fundamental question of constitutional theory and the radical way in which it was answered by the Supreme Court. We law professors have hidden all this from our students, and by hiding it from our students, we have hidden it from ourselves. Thank you.